The year 2000 saw Louisiana's Ragin' Cajuns reach the ultimate goal of every college baseball team. Rosenblatt Stadium, Omaha, Nebraska, the College World Series. Most would tell you that the Cajuns' road to Omaha began in February with a win over Sam Houston State on opening day. In fact, the Cajuns' road to Omaha began earlier, much earlier. Cajuns, or as it was known, Bulldogs baseball, goes all the way back to the 1903 season. Not much is known about those early years. Records only exist beginning in 1960. There were championships won, Gulf States Conference championships, and there were some good players. And through it all, there was a driving force. In Lafayette, he was Mr. Baseball. To many players, a surrogate father. And there were few who passed through without being touched by Marion Lartigue Moore. Well, obviously, Mr. Moore's been around baseball and baseball in Lafayette a lot longer than I've been around Lafayette. Um, what I know is that he is the rock. I mean, there was one thing that you could count on, and that was Mr. Teague Moore and his love for baseball and for doing it right. A graduate of the Citadel and uh, tremendous integrity, a strong will um, for those people who played under him. He coached many years. Uh, they knew that he wanted baseball played the right way. He has been a tremendous supporter of baseball at USL and now University of Louisiana. Obviously the field's named after him. A lot of the improvements, a lot of the success, a lot of the support comes from his involvement and his dedication to baseball and to Raging Cajun baseball. Teague Moore was an all-giving man. Uh, baseball was his, 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 that was, that was his life. Uh, and uh, he never looked back when he came to baseball. Great guy. While Mr. Moore nurtured the program, the program grew. In 1972, the University of Southwestern Louisiana began playing in the NCAA Division I ranks. In 1981, the university hired its first full-time baseball coach. Others followed. Then in 1988, a new coach arrived. Mike Bollinger, an assistant at the University of Oklahoma, was brought in to take the Cajuns to the next level, and he did. For the first time in 1988, the Ragin' Cajuns made the field of 48 teams in the NCAA tournament. Their stay was short-lived, but the foundation for the postseason had been set. Then in 1991, Bollinger led the Cajuns all the way to the regional finals. That team set school records for games played and victories. The 1991 team played on the regional's final day, defeating Texas A&M and South Alabama on the way to the finals, but fell short of the dream of Omaha. I remember the regional being very wet and uh, very long. They had rain trouble in Baton Rouge and at Alex Box, and it, it seemed to take forever to get the regional done. And of course, the Cajuns made it to the final round where they would have had to have beaten LSU twice in order to move to uh, to Omaha and by that time the pitching was completely done. I remember the games against South Alabama and this was right before the Cajuns joined the Sun Belt Conference and it would become a regular thing and there was no love lost whatsoever uh, between these clubs already. But you talk about the, the team from the early 90s of about a decade ago, what made them different. First of all was I think the approach that Mike Bollinger took, he treated them more as professionals. It was, uh, it was a much looser uh, group with, with much more freedom and what made them so good was their attitude. Not that they weren't talented, they had a great pitching staff. They had Houghton to Jesus, I think, starting Gotro, closing. Chris Benhart pitching and at first base, and he was absolutely nuts. He had absolutely no fear whatsoever. In fact, he took a line, he, took a, he was hit by a pitch on his, uh, his right elbow, and he was a left-hander, and it, his bursar sack burst. And he pitched against South Alabama that way in relief with his elbow, a huge bandage on it. Couldn't do anything with the right hand, but he could throw. And he's out there on the mound screaming into the South Alabama dugout, daring them to get somebody up and hit him. It was that sort of attitude. They were certainly talented, like I said. You know, Papa Ramos is still the absolutely the best college baseball player I've ever seen. Uh, but they were, they had a swagger and an, uh, an arrogance that you liked to see, but on the other hand, they didn't make very many friends uh, that season. But they weren't out there to make friends. I remember one time an umpire had to come to the Cajun dugout 
and plead with Bollinger to, uh, to get his players to back off on the bench jockeying. And Bo said, but we're yelling at our players. And the umpire said, I don't care, it's too vicious, I can't take it anymore. It had to be the first time, and maybe the only time in, in baseball history that an umpire had to come to a dugout and ask a coach to tone down the bench jockeying on his own teammates. Another regional appearance followed in 1992, but Cajun fortune slipped in the next two seasons, and Bollinger, the Cajun's winningest baseball coach, stepped down during the summer of 1994. Faced with having to compete in the rugged Sun Belt Conference and facing NCAA sanctions, Athletic Director Nelson Schecksneider began the search for a new coach, a hiring that would be crucial to Cajun baseball fortunes. Nearly 40 applicants sent in their names, but Schecksneider knew what qualities the new coach must have. Well, as with all of our searches, obviously we want someone who's had experience in college. We'd like someone who's had head coaching experience. We'd like someone who's had ties to Louisiana and ties to the university. And most of all, someone who's been successful. Um, success is the key ingredient. We spoke to a number of people around the country and had some very qualified candidates, both young coaches, uh, young head coaches, assistant coaches. We had a coach, a longtime coach, who had been to, I think, 11 NCAA regionals and five College World Series. Um, the thing that we kept coming back to was Tony Robichaux, his ties to Acadiana, to Lafayette, to the University of Louisiana, and the success he had in building McNeese as a baseball program. Tony took a program with limited resources and brought them to an NCAA regional, and that was a tremendous accomplishment. Also, he has tremendous values. He is very principled. He cares about the right thing. He wants to do things the right way and he cares about his players, his coaches, the administration, the integrity and the image of the university. And so as we went through the process of oh, a couple of dozen candidates, we kept coming back to Tony Robichaux as the one to lead our program. The man he chose was a 33-year-old who already had seven years experience as a head coach. He was a native son, having pitched for the Cajuns in 1984 and he absolutely had the qualities and vision necessary for what would be a daunting task. Robichaux had no time to recruit, having gotten the job in November of 1994. His first Cajun club finished sixth in the Sun Belt Conference, and because of probation, couldn't even participate in the conference postseason tournament. Well, one, I think in the recruiting uh, world, as we're recruiting, the weather's good here, the people, the community's good, uh, our university, uh, is a very good university academically, which is what their first goal is, is to be a student athlete. Uh, and I think that the, the biggest thing that we try to impress on our athletes is that they've got a place to come and get better uh, as a player and to also get better as a person. And we feel that making them better as a person is what, it, what will eventually determine uh, what we call the real games. That's life's personal and professional challenges and those are the games that we try to prepare our recruits for when they come in to play for us here at UL. But after the 1995 season, Robichaux began assembling the pieces that would pay dividends during the second half of the decade. He put together his coaching staff, hiring one of the nation's top amateur coaches as his top assistant. Tony Robichaux attracted me over here when he got the job here at USL. I actually called him before he interviewed for the job here and congratulated him knowing that he would be the next head coach here. And then the opportunity came when he had an opening the following year. I of course applied over here and uh, always wanted to work with Tony and uh, figured we'd be a, a good team working together since he's a the kind of pitching guy and I'm the offensive guy. So it's been a, been a pretty good little marriage so to speak. He added Cajun alumnus Anthony Babineau to handle first base and infield duties, and later added assistant Jason Gonzalez, another former Cajun player with college coaching experience to round out his staff. I think the whole philosophy, philosophy behind that, uh, as far as the passion that we have for the game and for the players and for the job that we do out in the community, um, of course all of us played college baseball, all uh, four of us that are on the staff. Um, we're all fairly young, all pretty close in age, so we get along great. Um, myself and Coach Gonzalez playing with a lot of, uh, you know, the alumni through the years that we were here, uh, that makes us want to stay connected uh, with 
the past with Coach Robichaud playing here, the players from his era, you know, that makes him want to stay connected with the past. Plus, um, you know, even the, the guys that we didn't play with, we feel that they ought to have a right and uh, the privilege to coming back here uh, to show off the place that they played college baseball to their kids, uh, you know, to their wives. Uh, if they weren't married at the time, which they probably weren't that when they played. Um, so I think that's the passion that we have for getting all the alumni back. Uh, as far as for the staff working so good together, uh, like I said, we're all fairly young, close in age. Uh, we're all each other's best friends. Uh, our wives are real close, do a lot of things together. And when we started this uh, project, I guess six years ago when Coach Rowe first got here, uh, we spent a lot of time out on the field, making the field better, doing different projects around the stadium to get the stadium looking nicer. Uh, so I think just the time that we spent together, uh, we, we all push each other, we clown around with each other at the office during the game. Uh, and I think we just have that closeness that you know, makes us want to continue uh, to be the best you know, coaches and, and role models for our players that we can be. I think it's the past players that helped pave the way for what uh, these guys were able to accomplish last year. Uh, these guys set the foundation in terms of, uh, of a winning tradition. There were uh, conference championships being won uh, in the late 80s, late 80s and the early 90s. And, uh, you know, I, those, those guys played just the biggest part as the, the team from last year. And, you know, they, they should feel just as much a part of this as, as everybody else. And, and you know, that, that's what being a Raging Cajun is, is, is linking the past to the present and everybody coming together as one. Still under NCAA sanctions and minus a full scholarship, the Cajuns managed to finish third in the Sun Belt in 1996, but were a quick two and out in the conference tournament. But in 1997, the sanctions were lifted, and Robichaux added more pieces of the puzzle, bringing in pitcher Trey Poland, designated hitter Justin Hemme, outfielder pitcher B.J. Ryan, and a young freshman named Stephen Feehan. The Cajuns shocked everyone by winning the Sun Belt Conference Championship with a 43-16 record. They were invited as an at-large team to the NCAA Regionals in Starkville, Mississippi. The tournament was not a success for the Cajuns as they lost both of their games. But with their first postseason appearance in five years, Robichaux's team served notice that Cajun baseball was back. In 1998, the Cajuns finished second in the Sun Belt Conference, but went to Mobile, Alabama and won the conference tournament to win an automatic berth in the NCAA tournament. But again, the promise of 1998 success led to disappointment as the Cajuns were eliminated in two games again. The 1999 season saw some new faces blending in with a young but veteran pitching staff to give the Cajuns a solid shot at more success. The Cajuns didn't win the Sun Belt Conference and hoped the conference tournament would give them the boost they needed for their third consecutive trip to the NCAA tournament. The Cajuns won their first two tournament games, but came up short in the next two. But it was enough to give the Cajuns a place in the expanded NCAA field of 64. The Cajuns rolled into the regionals, defeating the perennial collegiate baseball powerhouse Texas Longhorns. Up next, the Cajuns won a nail-biter over the host Houston Cougars 5-3. This propelled the Cajuns into the final game, and with the help of a 19-run explosion and the solid pitching of Scott Dolman, the Cajuns were able to secure their first ever regional championship. The Cajuns took on top-ranked Rice at the Houston Astrodome and served notice that they were there to play. The Cajuns won game one, leaving them just one win away from the College World Series. But Rice came back and won the last two games of the series, and Cajun seniors were left heartbroken while the underclassmen gained valuable experience for the year 2000. I think it was, and especially the game, uh, I know a lot of people probably heard this story, the game that Scott lost. Uh, he kept the box score uh, hung up in his uh, locker the whole year with uh, him being the loser of that game that he pitched uh, in the Astrodome. And I know that's what drove him the whole season. Uh, but I think what, what drove the whole team was just, we knew how close we were in 99 to get there and walking off the floor of that Astrodome, uh, you know, watching Rice celebrate. We knew that's the position that we wanted to be in for the following season. As the 2000 season neared, Robichaux's squad, fueled by their near miss the year before, prepared with a quiet confidence. Well, I think the, the, the biggest thing about the 99 team is that we, we, we grouped a bunch of special players that decided to play the game with passion, uh, play the game with energy, um, and then 
enough kids to believe that they really could get to Omaha. A lot of problem you have uh, at a lot of the institutions around the country is the players that get together believe that Omaha is only for about 10 schools around the country on a yearly basis and we got enough kids together that believe uh, that we really could get to Omaha. Even though we didn't get to Omaha uh, Friday night after the Rice win, uh, we were very close to Omaha and I think what that did for our program was enable us to come back in the fall to work out with the understanding that we almost were in Omaha and that we really could get to Omaha. The nucleus of the 1999 team returned while some new faces were added to help in the quest. The Cajuns began the 2000 season with five wins in their first six games. Then, facing some of the best competition that they could find, the Cajuns went on a school record tying 17 game winning streak winning seven of those games against teams that were either in the 1999 regionals or teams that would be in the 2000 field. The streak finally broke on a Saturday in New Orleans, but then the Cajuns won another five in a row to run their record to an astonishing 28-2 and two and a top 10 ranking in the polls. April 5th brought the largest crowd of the season to Teague Moore Field. The Tulane Green Wave, an in-state rival who had had their own share of NCAA tournament appearances in the 90s, provided the opposition and the crowd packed it in for the midweek non-conference contest. They came almost within a heartbeat of one another. And the lows to start off with that, I think, would be the tailspin that the club went into after they beat Tulane at, at uh, Moore Field. <clears throat> Yet the victory against Tulane was discounting the regional victory against East Carolina, the road victory at South Carolina, and what they managed to accomplish in, in Omaha, I think that Tulane victory was, uh, was the highlight. And uh, the at-bat that Tommy Clark gave them in the bottom of the ninth inning, again, people are going to be talking about that and remembering that fondly for years. Excuse me, and there's a reason that they should. The case can be made that there has never been a more important bat in the school's history. And uh, I'll tell you why. In the bottom of the ninth inning of that ball game, Tulane held the lead, and Henry Bonilla, who was their pitcher, who was one of their starters and a good pitcher, but not having the sort of season up until that point. This was fairly late in the season, you understand. Not having the kind of year that I'm sure he would like to, but as one Tulane backer told me, it was the most effective he's been with his breaking pitch all season and it was effective enough to the point that the Cajuns were uh, were, were flustered. Uh, they get to the bottom of the ninth inning, they're getting shut out. Uh, they've got one, two hits, uh, Max, and then, you know, they look absolutely dead in the water. Well, get a base runner on, and two outs, bottom of the ninth, and Tommy Clark comes to the plate. Now here's a young man who transferred in from Texas A&M. It's his, his only uh, season that he's going to be playing for the Cajuns, and nobody thought to count it at the time, but Clark fouled off somewhere seven, eight pitches. Benia kept on coming in with fastballs, and Clark kept getting a piece of it. And for a regular season game, a non-conference affair fairly late in the season, the tension was awfully high in the stands. Packed house, first of all. Two lanes in, good club out of Conference USA. Two nice records, and people had a notion that this game could mean something later on. Although I don't think anyone had an idea that it would mean as much as it did. Finally, Clark, after again the seven or eight foul balls, gets a pitch he can handle. Two hops, left center field wall, triple, tying run. Next batter, Brooks and Zarelli hits something off the end of the bat that the two-lane second baseman can't handle. Winning run scores, they win the ball game. With a top five ranking and a 29-2 and two record, the Cajuns hit the toughest part of their schedule, an eight-game road trip that would see the Cajuns go from Miami to Baton Rouge to Little Rock to Wichita. And during that time, the Cajuns found out that they were mortal. With a host regional site now secure, the Cajuns gained a little momentum by winning three games in the Sun Belt Conference Tournament and then returned home to Teague Moore Field for the NCAA Regionals. First up was old rival McNeese State, where Robichaux coached for seven seasons. The Cajuns and Cowboys split two games in the regular season, and Robichaux chose Justin Gabriel as his Game 1 starter. But quickly the Cajuns fell behind five to nothing, and it would take a rally before over 3,000 fans at Teague Moore Field to keep the Cajuns out of the loser's bracket. But rally they did, and at the end of six, the Cajuns had tied the game at 5-5. A sparkling defensive play by Nathan Nelson ended a McNeese threat in the seventh, and then the Cajun bats came alive. 
The 11-5 victory sent the Cajuns into a meeting with top-seeded East Carolina on Saturday. That, that gave us such a tremendous advantage, uh, being able to play in front of the home, home people who had supported us all year. Uh, they acted almost as a tenth man on our side. And uh, th that was a big, big part of the reason we were able to be successful in our home field. The Pirates led 3-1 three after three. And when the Pirates started another rally, Robichaux brought in freshman Andy Grove from the bullpen. The left-hander slammed the door, and the Cajuns rallied to win 5-3, putting Louisiana in the driver's seat, just one win away from their second straight Super Regional. On Sunday, the Cajuns had a rested ace in Scott Doman. Doman had struggled during the last month of the season, but after giving up three runs in the first inning, the junior All-American shut the door and left after seven innings with an 8-4 lead. The bullpen held the lead, and the Cajuns finished Region 16 undefeated, regional champions for the second straight year. The Cajuns were in a position they found themselves in a year ago, champions of a regional, but on the road again for the next round. This time, Louisiana was faced with a trip to Columbia, South Carolina to take on the best team in America. After losing a close one in the first game Friday night, the Cajuns put the Gamecocks in the same position the Cajuns had been in the year before, one win away from the College World Series. For game two, Robichaux chose Cajun freshman Andy Groh, and Louisiana's bats came alive, and Groh, after a shaky start, shut down the Gamecocks seven to one. Now it was the Cajun ace, Scott Doman's turn, and the Gamecocks were not going to go quietly. To play South Carolina, number one team, there's a lot of hype about that, being number one, the so-called number one, and uh, you can't help but uh, enjoy that and sit back, and we've been there the year before that, we played number one Rice. So we really weren't as worried because we're so, so more, uh, we're more experienced in that aspect of playing the number one team, so we weren't worried about it. And uh, we wanted to go in there and play the baseball we played all year. We knew if we do that, it'd be a tight series, and it was a tight series, and we gave the fans what they wanted, and South Carolina fans didn't come out the way they hoped. The score went back and forth, and it came down to the final inning and the Cajuns holding a 3-2 lead. With Gordon O'Brien facing pinch hitter Bo Mobley, the years of hard work had finally paid off. What fans around the country considered the unthinkable had happened. Number one had fallen, and for the first time, the Sun Belt Conference would be represented at Omaha's Rosenblatt Stadium. And the pitch, ground ball toward first base. Atwood will take it himself. All year long, they clicked their heels and said there's no place like home. Now the Raging Cajuns will end the 2000 season in baseball's version of Oz. Louisiana is in the College World Series. Hundreds of Cajun fans made the trip to Omaha for baseball's best party. Most were glad that their Cajuns had made it this far. But Robichaux and his team didn't want their first trip to Omaha to merely be a sightseeing tour. Seeing Rosenblatt Stadium is, I mean, is beyond a dream come true. You know, just seeing it on TV and then going and seeing it in real life, it's almost like you're looking at an amusement park for the first time. You know, you just, you just get that childhood excitement, you know, and then walking out on the field for the first time is just, I mean, you can't hardly describe it, you know, and seeing the different, the flags of the teams you play in are all national powerhouses, and it, uh, and it was just a great, awesome feeling. Well, um, once the, the out was made at first base, um, a dream really had come true, not only for myself, but a lot of our players, and we had, you know, I had made a personal vow uh, years before that, you know, after we had pretty good seasons but we failed to get to Omaha, boosters would call and ask me to take a trip to Omaha because they knew I enjoyed baseball so much and I had made a vow that I didn't want to go as a spectator, that I always wanted to go with my team and the biggest honor in, in the out that was made was that I was going to now go to Omaha but be in the dugout and be with my ball club versus buying a ticket and sitting in the bleachers and that was the biggest honor and, and once we got there it's, it's everything, you know, everybody once said, it's everything that you look for when you're growing up watching ESPN and uh, it was just a great honor to watch our players go through the gate and to represent uh, the, the city of Lafayette, the surrounding areas, 
all the Raging Cajun people, our university, and most importantly, the state. The state of Louisiana, I thought, was just a great opportunity for us to represent. And the way they embraced you, uh, the, the feeling of Omaha um, was, was something that now I understand why most teams work so hard to get back. And hopefully that will be the catalyst uh, for this year's ball club so that they can see uh, what accomplishments last year's team did so that, that now we can set that standard to not be satisfied because we were tied the third in the country, but now try to become the best team in the country. Up first was Stanford of the Pac-10. The Cardinal boasted two of the nation's top pitchers and a team that played solid defense, along with good hitting and great power in the middle of the lineup. There were a few opening night jitters for UL. Five Cajun pitchers gave up 10 walks, and there were a few lapses in the field. But the Cajun bats kept them in the game. Home runs by Rick Heidel, Jarvis Larry, and Nathan Nelson made it close. But the Cardinals sent the Cajuns into the loser's bracket 6-4. to four. Two days later, it was an elimination game for the Cajuns. But that was nothing new to this team, who had already compiled a 5-1 postseason record when their backs were against the wall. Robichaux called on Scott Doman to keep the Cajuns in Omaha for at least one more game. Danny Maziotti's homer and Jarvis Larry's sacrifice fly gave the Cajuns an early 2-0 lead. In the fifth, back-to-back two-out doubles by Rick Heidel and Stephen Feehan made it 4-1, and the Cajuns got insurance runs in the seventh and eighth. Doman allowed only five hits and two earned runs in six-plus innings, and Gordon O'Brien's fourth save closed out the Cajuns' 6-3 win. The Cajuns had an extra day off because of weather before facing another elimination game, this time against Clemson of the ACC. The Tigers had already won 51 games on the season and were one of the favorites coming into the College World Series. The Cajuns struck first in the fourth, with Will Hawkins and Tommy Clark coming through with back-to-back -back home runs. In the fifth, Stephen Feehan bunted for a hit with one out, and that's when the Cajun style of play Aggression on the base paths, manufactured a run. Feehan stole second and went to third. What he did after that surprised most of the thousands in attendance. The daring steal of home sent the Cajun fans into a frenzy as UL took a three to nothing lead after five. Justin Gabriel was pitching for the second time in the series and completely stymied the Tigers through the first six innings, allowing just one hit and two walks. But in the seventh, back-to-back -back walks started the inning. An error, a wild pitch, and two hits later, Clemson had scored four times to take the lead four to three. What happened next will be forever remembered in Cajun baseball history. Uh, well, I, I had just, you know, hitting the ball left field, and I just gotten on first base. So I really, I wasn't thinking a whole lot. You know, I'm just hoping that Feehan can hit the ball in the outfield, ground ball, some kind of way to score the run and, you know, knowing that I have to break up a double play if need be. And the very next pitch, you know, he drops down the bunt. You know, so I, you know, my job is to get to second as fast as I can and I actually slowed down because I didn't want to get thrown out rounding too far for second base back. And uh, I kind of saw the ball get away and Melee said, well, I got third, you know. And then I could just see it in Coach's eyes. He was sending me, so I just, I got on my horse and. I really didn't know the play was going to be that close, you know, but uh, when I started my slide in, I could see him starting to bring the tag and just, I was just hoping that I could get there before him and uh, I touched home plate and looked up and umpire said safe. It's, it's like I, I really didn't know what to do at first, you know, I didn't, it, it happened so quick that I almost didn't realize it was the final run of the game and we won the game. It was, it was pretty amazing. You know, they, they made the, their pitching change, and Rick was up at, at bat. And I went over to see what Coach Simo was telling Rick to see what kind of advice he was giving him. And from that point on right there, I just started focusing my attention on if Rick gets on base, my job is to bunt. I knew that from the get-go. I didn't need a sign. It's understood uh, and it did close game situation like that. Uh, we, we practiced in situations during our fall inner squads uh, when we would come back and play and during the uh, spring right at the beginning. So we've gone through these situations before and I've been here long enough to know that I needed to bunt. And it was just a matter of him saying, giving me the sign bunt and, and just 
getting my job done. The winning run in the bottom of the night is over at first. Rick Heidel once again has a huge hit. Laying it down for the lead run. They're going to score. Jones Larry to tie it. The ball gets away. Riley trying to cover in the collision at first. And coming in to score. Here's the play at the plate. He's safe. Diving in ahead of the throw is Rick Heidel. And Louisiana Lafayette on a scrambling play has advanced and eliminated Clemson from the College World Series. The task facing the Cajuns was still a large one. They had to go against undefeated Stanford, needing to beat the Cardinal twice to reach the championship game. Early, it looked like the Cajuns were up to the challenge, but this was not to be the Cajuns' day. For the only time all season, virtually unheard of in the college game, the Cajun pitching staff allowed more than nine runs, and Stanford ended the Cajuns' first trip to Omaha 19-9. The Cajuns went home tied for third, but wound up first in the hearts of Rosenblatt and fans across the country. It's safe to say records fell during the 2000 season. The Cajuns' 49 wins tied the school record. The pitching staff finished third in the nation and earned run average. The Cajuns hit 83 home runs, also a school record, and hit more home runs in Omaha than any other team. This year, we want to go back. You know, we, we've been there, we've tasted it. And uh, we're going to prove that this, this program is, is as strong as it's been in the past. And we have some, some new, some, some good guys coming in that can swing the bat and help our pitching staff. And uh, we got some good guys. And, you know, we don't have guys that are, you know, very arrogant. We have guys that want to work hard and want to be here. And uh, it's, it's going to be great. I really see us going back to Omaha. And this year we want to bring home the title. A dream season to be sure, and another step toward the ultimate goal.